I'd also like to pay my respects to our brothers and sisters from other country who are here today. And I want to thank Gary, I can't see him in, in the audience, I'm sure he's out there somewhere for his fantastic presentation this morning. Um, and what a fabulous presentation we had from our um, public school students. It really makes you proud as an educator when you can see the fine examples of the product of the public education system. But in giving uh, the acknowledgement, I just want to reflect on the acknowledgement of country because really it is our opportunity to show our deep respect for the spiritual um, uh, connection that Aboriginal people have with their land. But it's also our opportunity to affirm our commitment to fighting the injustices that they face, um, not only with their fight for constitutional recognition and in terms of the reconciliation movement, but the fact that our students, that our students who come from a, a disadvantaged background, um, who are also Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, face five to six year achievement gaps when you compare them to students who come from an advantaged background. And I think um, in the context uh, of that discussion, who would have thought that in 2015, that in 2015 we would be dealing with issues such as state and federal governments talking about the forced removals of Aboriginal people from their homelands. It's an absolute shame. It's an absolute shame and it's something that we must fight. I wanted to start today by, and it's interesting in terms of the uh, um, uh, uh, suspension of standing orders that uh, was just debated, because I want to talk about what's happening nationally with respect to asylum seekers and, and uh, refugees. Um, we have to speak out about this because these children, these children who are in detention centres deserve a better life. They deserve to be living in our communities, they deserve to be attending our schools, going home after schools with their friends, and that's not what's, that is not what's happening. Currently, um, we have over 231 children being detained in Australia. Nowhere else in the world do we have this situation. The country that comes closest to this is England, where they can hold people for 72 hours. I mean, what's happened to us as a nation where we think it's okay to lock these children and their families up and deny them the fundamental rights of freedom? So we have to speak out. It's an important debate because if we don't, comrades, who's going to? You know, are we going to sit here and watch this great wall of injustice that's being put around our nation in our name? Well, not in my name and I hope not in yours. It's something that we must fight. When the report, um, The Forgotten Children, was released this year, I had the opportunity to have a briefing just prior to the release. And can I tell you, it's left me with just, just the most, you know, utmost shame of what we're doing as a nation. Stories of women sewing their lips together in protest because their babies can't learn to walk properly. The reason they can't learn to walk properly is because the families are contained in rooms a metre and a half by a metre and a half, with bunk beds on one side, mattresses that come out, no room for a cot for a baby, no room for a baby to learn to crawl. Outside of these rooms, we have decking, splinters, 45 degree heat, dusty, dusty, um, dusty playgrounds, too hot for kids to play. Women sewing their lips together in protest. We've seen a steady release of um, stories about sexual assault, about um, uh, abuse of children, not in our name, not in our name. Okay, I thought I might just uh, uh, start with um, a conversation about TAFE. And firstly, can I commend, uh, commend you on the fantastic work that you are doing with respect to fighting the TAFE campaign? Um, it was certainly evident in the lead up to the state election, uh, but also in Victoria and Queensland, with respect to the strong commitment that, um, that our members have for TAFE. You know our TAFE system is under threat in terms of budget cuts and a privatisation agenda, which is seeing funding go to private providers. And this slide here will give you a bit of an indication in terms of uh, gov the shift in ter of government funding to non-TAFE providers uh, between 2008 and 2012. And we know that private providers are poorly regulated um, and that they're targeting vulnerable students with expensive, low-quality courses that are paid for, paid for by the taxpayers' funds. Um, through the VET fee help system. So we're seeing a significant lack of investment in vocational education around the country. And uh, let's talk about that in terms of the impact. What does that mean for the sector? 
What it means is course closures, it means job cuts, uh, it means students being saddled with huge debt burdens, and really, it gives us an indication of the privatisation agenda that, these, that this government uh, has. And I think that TAFE is only the start, and certainly when we talk about um, what's happening in the Federation reform agenda in terms of the school sector, um, there's, a, there's a big conversation to be had there. So we know that if this continues, then the public uh, system, which does a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of trade skills and working with disadvantaged um, students, will be replaced uh, by a network of private companies, each trying to cherry pick the most lucrative courses and offer expensive and low quality um, education to our students. The TAFE sector is crucial for Australia, um, in particular for regional Australia and also for our most disadvantaged students because it offers students a second chance at education. It offers them the opportunity um, to engage in study that can uh, head them out into other pathways. Whilst we were focusing on um, the higher education debate this year, the federal budget delivered an absolute whack for TAFE. It came in quietly and um, I think it's something that you should all be aware of. It forecast a 75% increase in the number of vet fee help loans from 128,000 this year um, to over 225,000 in uh, 2018 and 19. What does that equate to? A $4.4 billion student debt. Student debt, debt for our kids going through the TAFE system and kids who are trying to get, uh, you know, better themselves in terms of their education. It's an absolute disgrace. And I think that um, uh, you will all stand with me when I say that defending TAFE must be a key part of the work that we do um, because we want to make sure that our students do have pathways uh, with respect to their education. But look, there is some good news. Last week we were in Canberra uh, for National TAFE Day and uh, we heard an event at Parliament House uh, during the evening and can I say I've never seen so many politicians attend one of our events. So the national conversation is happening around TAFE and it's to do with the fact that we have such a strong campaign and that our members are so committed to it. Um, at this event we had um, uh, Simon Birmingham and uh, uh, Bill Shorten and uh, Leah Rhiannon uh, present with respect to their party's positions on TAFE and there was some good news because what we saw from um, the ALP is a commitment, a commitment to guarantee that a proportion of VET funding will go to TAFE should they be elected and that they would work with state and territory governments to make sure there's a national plan uh, for TAFE. So it's, it's understanding that this is a key issue. Now we have to get a bipartisan commitment with respect to um, TAFE but it's starting, that conversation is starting and that gives me hope. I think we do have to understand the conservative forces that are at work here in Australia and uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you're uh, as familiar with them as I am and certainly I think Maury probably uh, gave uh, some information in terms of the privatisation agenda in his speech yesterday. Um, but these conservative forces really are about undermining the public education system. And note I said system. We're not a series of little schools and islands disconnected from each other. We are connected by a system. And a system that has to offer a high quality education to every child, no matter where, they're, where they come from, no matter what their background. And a system that has to be funded so that um, schools, so that our early childhood sector and our TAFE sector uh, have the resources that they need um, to work with our kids. But yet there's been a steady stream of attacks on this system from people such as Christopher Pine, and I apologise, South Australia apologise for him, but uh, anyway. And he stated publicly, it's not a federal government responsibility to fund public education. Absolute shame. It's fundamentally a, government responsibility, a federal government responsibility to fund education. Christopher believes that that sits with the states. So it's no surprise that uh, one of the questions raised in the Abbott government's reform of the Federation White Paper uh, and subsequently the release of the Green Paper last week um, talks about the separation of federal and state powers with respect to education. And since the election of the Abbott government, we've had a steady stream of broken promises. And this is the first promise that was broken. You'll remember this. It happened about seven weeks after the federal election. And it has been uh, tagged as um, one of the major first broken promises uh, of the Abbott government. We're going to keep the promise that we actually made, not the promise that some people thought that we made, or the promise that some people might have liked us to make. 
Do you remember Tony Abbott saying that? It set the agenda for, uh, for our campaign for Gonski, quite frankly. Um, but we've also seen a, a, quite a negative political attack on our profession. We hear the same old teacher quality, you know, changes to the Australian curriculum because of the lefty element. Poor performance, Teach for Australia, the list goes on. And if you have a look at um, the Australian government's website, Students First, you will see some of this agenda reflected there. Just last week, we saw the announcement of a new um, head of ACARA, Professor Stephen Schwartz. Now, if you think about the conservative forces that are at play, this is, this is a clear indication of the challenges that we have. Let me tell you a little bit about um, Professor Schwartz in terms of what we know. He's a director for Teach for Australia. He's on the board of Acquire Learning, which is one of Australia's biggest private providers for vocational education. And his claim to fame is that he was nominated as Britain's worst boss for the TV show of the same name uh, when he was vice chancellor uh, in London. Need I go on? These are the luminaries that we now have uh, in, in key positions. It follows, of course, the, the appointments of people such as Trevor Fletcher, you'll know him, and Jennifer Buckingham to the Aitzel board, along with the removal of all union representation from that board. So there can be no doubt where Christopher Pine's conservative agenda is heading. Last week we saw the release of the um, Green Paper uh, for the reform of the Federation, and whilst there was a major storm over the proposals to means test parents who send their children to public schools, and, ri and rightly so that there should be a major storm, when the very, very foundation of the public education system is under attack. There were other options in that paper which didn't really get an airing, and they're options that we need to be forewarned about. And that is to separate the federal responsibility for public education. There are dark days ahead for us, comrades. It's more than the Gonski campaign. We are in a fight to protect our students, their families, and our communities. We are in a fight to protect public education. Because there's just one thing standing in the way of Christopher and Tony, and that's us. It's our union, it's our capacity to campaign, and it's the connection that we have with our communities right across Australia. But I think we cannot view these issues in isolation. They are all part of a much broader conservative campaign to undermine the teaching profession and to open the doors to private provision of education services. And you only have to look at what's happening uh, across the seas and the work that um, our previous president, Angelo Gavrilatis, uh, is doing with respect to, respect to globalisation and privatisation uh, of public education around the world. So, this year we've had the Abbott budget, their budget and uh, quite frankly, it was a fail. It failed on Gonski. I don't know if you watched the budget commentary, but um, where was education? On all the websites, in the papers, 10 key issues in terms of uh, uh, Australia and the budget, education simply wasn't there. And that's because Abbott has walked away from education. It didn't rate. It confirmed their intention to walk away from News 5 and 6 of Gonski. So from 2018, what will Gonski be replaced with? Well, it'll be replaced with um, indexation at the current rate of CPI, which I think at the moment is 1.3. You compare that to the schooling resource standard of 4.7 and 3% indexation, and it will be replaced with uh, money based on student enrolment growth. So massive cuts to the education sector. $3.8 billion cut to school funding, which equates to around 20,000 teachers. 2.7 for public schools alone. Just think what we could do with that funding. Just think about the impact for our schools. So no Gonski. No loadings, no national partnerships, therefore virtually no Commonwealth funding um, targeted at poor and disadvantaged students. Can you see the connection? Reform of the Federation, take the funding away, hand it all over to states and let them do what they like. And that is a significant issue because if you have a look uh, with the Gonski uh, implementation around the country, after the federal election when Christopher Pine came in and he took away accountability, uh, and uh, transparency, we've seen a number of um, states and territories go off and do their own thing because they're no longer accountable. And we see a, a whole range of um, uh, cuts happening in Northern Territory, Tasmania, WA, our students' money. 
that's what it is. So this is a slide, I'm not sure, have you got the slide? Oh yes, good, you have, that's okay. This is a slide about why we need Gonski. I thought it was important to remind us today about the issue in terms of resourcing. So you can see there, um, and this is based on uh, information from my school. It's funny how, that, uh, how we're actually able to pull some of the data off of my school and use it. But $12,400 12, for public school students when you compare to independent schools at $18,000 a student, recurrent funding. This is recurrent funding. Now you know this is reality because you know the resources that are in place in some of our uh, private and independent schools and you know the resources that are not in place in some of our um, disadvantaged schools. Okay. I just thought I'd share this slide with you because it is, it is evidence um, of the achievement gaps that are there with respect to our disadvantaged and high SES students. Um, it is data that we've pulled off of NAPLAN uh, with respect to their students. And if you have a look at the column on the right, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 and 120, uh, each line relates to about one year of uh, achievement data for the students. Now have a look at the line in the middle, 120, six years with respect to um, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, students in terms of achievement gaps when you compare them to students from advantaged backgrounds. You can see also in terms of students who uh, live in poverty, anywhere from, six, uh, anywhere from uh, three to four years in terms of achievement gaps. This is why we campaign. This is why we do what we do. One of the other issues I just thought I'd bring to your attention is around the nationally consistent collection of data. Uh, many of you would be uh, familiar with this data process and understand that it was part of determining what the future loadings for disabilities would be uh, for our students. Now, that data process um, is underway. We are meant to have the data in the public domain now so that we can work out how many, uh, you know, what, what the unmet need is for um, students with a disability. But Christopher Pine has defied not one, not twice, but three times, um, a request from the Senate to release the data uh, from this process. Now, currently, we have 5% of our students um, with a disability being funded, so one in 20. One in 20 getting the funding. You know this because this is, it's happening in your schools and you know where this, the situation is in terms of unmet need. So how bad is the situation? What do we know? Well, about three weeks ago, thank goodness, the South Australian uh, Education Department released a document to the 70 schools that were going through the data collection process and uh, little did they realise how powerful it would be because in that document there was a single line that talked about um, the data process having found that 16.3% of our students have some kind of disability um, or learning difficulty, uh, mental or physical health condition. 16.3%. So we go from one in 20 to one in six. There's a massive unmet need and it's why we need to see the disability loading in place in our schools now. Um, Tony Abbott and Christopher Pine, I'll just move on, oh, sorry, might go back, um, made a commitment that the disability loading would be in place this year. Is it in your schools? No, it's not. They then came back and said, we'll do it in 2016. We're now hearing that it may be July 2016, and I think probably beyond. I think that they will do whatever they can to make this a non-election issue and just put it way off into the ether. Um, and we're going to do everything that we can to make sure it's a key election issue. Because what we know, what we know is that we have a massive community support in terms of this, uh, this issue. We went to Canberra earlier this year and we took families and students along to lobby politicians. And the comment that stuck with me is, is from a parent called Alex, and actually she's from New South Wales, and she said, it's shameful. It's shameful that I, as a parent, have to come to Canberra and remind these politicians of their fundamental responsibility to fund these children. It is shameful, but we're going to remind them all the way up to the, up to the federal election. From the state of our school... Um, <laughs> next. What do we need the funding for? Uh, from the state of our school survey that we put out into the field in February this year, we got very strong data about the need for uh, resources to meet, meet the learning needs of these students. Assistance for teachers in the classroom, specialist support, professional development for classroom teachers, vitally important. 
It also, uh, one of the questions that we asked, and I think this is a real warning sign for us, particularly when we have the conversation around initial teacher education, we also asked the question of whether, whether student teachers or a teacher's early career teachers thought that their training had provided them with the skills to teach students with disability. And 63% said no. 63% of our new educators said no, they did not feel that they had the skills. You follow that up with um, student intention of whether they're actually going to stay in the profession. There's a clear link. Proper professional development to make sure that graduate teachers have the skills that they need to be classroom ready and to cater for our students. There's a clear link. If we, if we provide that PD, we'll keep these people in our schools um, and that's going to be very important for our future. So, just moving on. You know why Gonski is so important. New South Wales is a standout state for us in terms of the implementation because we can get fantastic stories here about the Gonski campaign. And there's stories that we can share about what's happening in schools and the resourcing and how it's being used that we can share right around the country. Because it's not the case in every state and territory um, that Gonski funding is making its way into schools. As I've said, some schools have a, uh, some state and territories have quite a strong um, cost cutting agenda happening and uh, others such as South Australia where there is full implementation, the money is much less than what's happening in New South Wales. So 87% of principals whose schools have already received Gonski funding said it's making a significant difference. And I'm sure that that will be reflected by um, stories that you're telling uh, with respect to our campaign. So, where are we at with Gonski? Well, we're, at a re we're in a good place. There is a national conversation happening. You know, it, it was a little quiet for a while, but let's release the green paper and get people stirred up about public education, and let's put public education back on the agenda. I don't know if people saw um, David Gonski's um, uh, one plus one conversation uh, last night uh, on ABC 24, but halfway through the interviewer asked him about um, uh, his book, which he's titled I Gave a Gonski. It's a series of speeches, including the speech that he gave um, not so long ago about Gonski. And as part of the conversation, she said, do you know the term I, ga I gave a Gonski really should be in the dictionary because everybody's using it. It's something that everyone's talking about. So we have moved, we have moved Australia, we have moved our nation to a point where people understand the importance of needs-based funding and they're prepared to join us in terms of our campaign. On the issue around disability funding, we saw a shift uh, on our own website in terms of um, uh, adding over one or two days, four and a half thousand supporters. Issue, hook, emotional connection, people join up to the campaign. Currently, we've got 138,000 supporters on our website, and I hope you're all on it. If you're not, please sign up. Um, but we know that the vast majority of these supporters are actually not our members. They're community people that have connected with our campaign. Um, we have a, a very strong following on Twitter and obviously on Facebook as well. We're about to embark on the biggest phase of our campaign. We're putting on 19 local seat coordinators, and you'll have several in New South Wales um, working with Henry here. Um, and uh, I think it's very, very exciting because they'll be in place in the lead up to the federal election. And their, their role will be to go and connect with the local community. Their role will be to educate people, get people on board in terms of the campaign and work with local candidates and members of parliament to get a bipartisan commitment to needs-based funding. And the work is well underway. We're heading into the ALP um, National Conference and uh, whilst Bill Shorten's uh, last comment in terms of commitment to Gonski was in March, April last year, what will be taken to conference is a strong statement with respect to the ALP's support to the commitment to the principles of Gonski, uh, school funding reform, and also to needs-based funding, and their um, commitment to work with state and territory governments to make sure that the model is implemented. So I think that's a significant step forward, and we need that commitment from them. So, friends, um, we've got a, we have a tough job ahead of us, but uh, we're up for it. We're up for it because what we are going to do is make this federal government understand the power of our union. We're going to be out in our school communities, we'll be out in our um, early childhood and our TAFE sectors campaigning because there is one thing, one thing that is vitally important, and that is the future of our students 
and the future of public education. So today, I call on you. I call on you to stand with me and to fight for Gonski School funding reform. I call on you to stand with me and to fight this, with the Stop TAFE Cuts campaign. I call on you to stand with me and to fight for public education. And I look forward to seeing you on the campaign trail.